I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and this is the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. The Jeep Gladiator is a vehicle that I thought would be pretty successful when it launched in Australia at the start of last year. Of course, that timing, going into a global pandemic, was less than ideal. But also, vehicles like the Toyota Hilux, the Ford Ranger, the Volkswagen Amarok, they all continue to beat the Gladiator in a segment known as dual cab utes here in Australia. So, why is that? Well, there are a few reasons behind it, in my opinion. The first one was that when the Gladiator launched, it was really expensive here in Australia. There's now a cheaper model that you can buy that sits underneath this flagship off-roading focused Rubicon. So that's one side of the story. The other side though, is that it's a tough battle to convince Australians to go back to Jeep after a few years of quality woes. However, there's a longer warranty on this vehicle. And as we'll find out when we take it for a drive, it actually seems to stand up pretty well. Then there's the undeniable cool factor of the Gladiator. Most people I speak to think this thing looks absolutely awesome. And personally, I reckon if it doesn't bring a smile to your face, that's a little bit sad because this is ridiculous. I mean, it's five and a half meters long. It's basically a long wheelbase Wrangler with an extra tray added at the back of it. There's really no concessions to fitting it into your garage here. It's large, it's in charge. It's big, brash, and American. And frankly, if you like that style of vehicle, then the Gladiator may well be up your alley. And the Rubicon in particular is something quite special. And next up, we'll go through the engine and the basic capabilities of this off-roading focus specification. All Gladiators sold in Australia have the same engine behind the iconic Jeep seven slat grille. And it's a very traditional FCA slash Stellantis motor. The workhorse really for the past decade or so, it's a 3.6 litre Pentastar petrol V6 engine. And as we find out when we take this vehicle for a drive, it actually sounds really good, though it doesn't really go anywhere fast because while this is a big block petrol engine, it's not that powerful out on the road. 209 kilowatts of power, it's still more than you'll get in virtually any other dual cab, uh, but 347 Newton meters of torque tells the story there. There's not a huge amount of muscle behind it. And I think it was an interesting decision to run just with the petrol V6 because overseas you can get a turbo diesel V6 with the Gladiator, which probably would have been a better fit for the Australian market. Now, we don't really know why that didn't come. FCA, Stellantis haven't been too revealing on that question, but I'm gonna take a guess and say it was a packaging issue because diesel is the natural fit for dual cabs here in Australia. Now, while the Rubicon shares the same Pentastar petrol as the Night Eagle, which is the variant that sits underneath, the Rubicon in the lineup. The Rubicon really is the special Gladiator because it gets so much off-roading focused equipment. Now that starts with 32 inch BF Goodrich mud terrain tires measuring 255, 75, 17 inch wheels within those blacked out on this car. You also get a whole bunch of goodie designed to keep the Rubicon going and keeping up with vehicles like the Ford Ranger Raptor. So we've got two inch Fox shocks here, We've got an electronically disconnecting front sway bar, which you can do from the comfort of the front seat, which we'll check out in just a second. We've got locking front and rear differentials. We've got a four to one transfer case, 77.2 to one crawling ratio in this vehicle. We've got high strength steel plates protecting that transfer case and the fuel tank. We've got heavy duty forged tow hooks closed off here at the front, but exposed at the rear in bright red. So you are prepared to take the Rubicon pretty far off-road as you drive it out of the showroom. And of course, that's something that's gonna save quite a lot of time and money compared to doing the build yourself. That being said, doing a custom build is you know, part of the heritage of owning a dual cab here in Australia. So I'm keen to know your view as to whether these sorts of top-end specials, which are ready to roll, Gladiator Rubicon, Ranger Raptor, Navara Warrior, whether they're more your style or you prefer to do it yourself selecting from a catalog. Jumping up here into the cab of the Gladiator over the heavy duty rock rails, you don't actually get side steps on the Rubicon to enhance just how far it can go. So you kind of have to watch your trousers as you get in if you don't want to get muddy. Uh, you find that actually Jeep have given this thing a pretty nice interior. Quality is way, way better than Wranglers of old, even things like Grand Cherokees of old. The interior feels 
genuinely quite nice and a step above virtually any dual cab ute on the market here in Australia. Now, as for they're gonna hold up against the test of time, we don't really know. Although the current generation Wrangler, which the Gladiator is heavily based on, has now been available for quite a few years internationally. Now, looking across this dashboard, which is finished in this cool anodized red trim here in the Rubicon, we get a whole bunch of really neatly integrated tech, though there is a lot of it. There's a lot of buttons here. There's a lot going on, a lot to wrap your head around. But let's start with the 8.4 inch square touchscreen in this car, because that's actually quite a strong point. We've got Jeep's Uconnect software here, and it's really snappy, much snappier than almost any other system on the market. We've got wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, uh, and the sound quality is actually really good too through the Alpine nine speaker stereo in this car. Then we've got real climate controls, heated seats, heated steering wheel, quite a few little luxuries here in the Rubicon actually. And then dedicated controls down here for the locking diffs, for the off-road plus mode, which customizes your shifting and uh, throttle response and traction control to off-road conditions. We've got that disconnecting front sway bar, and then a whole bunch of ready to go auxiliary switches that you can wire in yourself. So you don't have to do kind of dodgy aftermarket looking controls. They're already integrated in the car, which is pretty sweet. Now, speaking of the luxuries in the Rubicon, we've got Jeep's McKinsey grade leather, which you can either get in black like this car or in saddle tan, which actually would look really nice with some of the nine exterior colors that you can choose on this vehicle. Equally, leather steering wheel, leather shifter, red stitched, easy controls on the wheel, and it's adjustable for both reach and rake, which I know we shouldn't have to say in 2021, but many dual cabs are still only adjustable for rake. Then we've got a digital screen in between analog gauges. That's clear enough and pretty easy to use. The real shock comes from the secondary materials on the door and on the dash, because they're all soft and squidgy, more like a luxury SUV than a dual cab ute. But given this thing is pushing you know, 80 grand or above on the road, you would expect that kind of plush treatment, but that you don't generally get it in dual cabs. So that's why it is surprising. Now, it'd also be a miss not to mention the roof, which is removable in this car. These front sections are really easy to take off actually to turn the Gladiator into something of a convertible or at least a giant sunroof. The back panel comes off as well. And then uh, you can't do it on the road, but you can take it a lot further by removing the doors, the windscreen goes down and clips onto the bonnet. So it all gets pretty uh, serious and extroverted, this car. Anyway, that's a look at the front. Let's check out the back seats. Here in the back seat of the Gladiator, it kind of echoes what's going on up front, which is that it's just a nicer experience than what you get in the dual cabs that this vehicle competes against. So for starters, the back seat is a little bit more comfortable than most, though it's still not you know, the last word in opulence. But the material qualities are all really good back here. Plus we've got the usual assortment of grab handles so that you can hold on when the going gets tough, which it really can in the Rubicon specification. And as for other amenities, we've got air vents. We've got controls for the electric windows here, which is kind of cool. We've got webbing on the back of the seats. We've got map pockets as well. And then this crossbar does stay in place to give the vehicle some semblance of rigidity when you take the doors and the roof off. And it also integrates more speakers from that Alpine system, which is pretty cool. And then here between the seats, we've also got a flip down armrest with a pair of cup holders and more drink holders down there. And we've also got Isofix points down here, nice and easily exposed in the seats. Though from a safety point of view, uh, the Gladiator scored three. Hmm. You know, not that bad, but also not that good. Here around the back of the Gladiator, I actually really like that Jeep's just gone from quite a classic Ute tailgate appearance. They haven't felt the need to put 100 badges on it. It just says Jeep, and that looks really cool. As I mentioned, being the Rubicon, we've got these red tow hooks here at the back, and the stand to the vehicle is just pretty epic, in my opinion. I like it. I also like the lighting, which is all LED and actually gives the Gladiator quite a cool signature on the road. Then dropping the tailgate, look at that damped. Made in America, y'all. Not like that crappy slamming down like you get on a whole bunch of dual cabs here in Australia. Now, this vehicle is optioned up with what's called the Lifestyle Equipment Group or something, Lifestyle Package, let's just call it that. That gives you this spray-in bed liner here, the trail rail system, so you can tie your stuff down in the positions you actually want it. 
And we have that fabric roll up tonneau cover, which is actually quite a neat way of doing things. The tub is pretty big, but because the structure of this vehicle is basically a five door Wrangler four wheel drive with a tray on the back, the length of the Gladiator is absurd. 5,591 millimeters long. So if you're planning on parking this vehicle in a garage, and today you've got something like a Ranger or an Amarok parked in there, you'll need to check on the test drive whether the Gladiator will actually fit because it's seriously a good 30 centimeters longer than most of its direct rivals here in Australia, which is pretty crazy. Speaking of other practicalities and capabilities, we have a payload of 693 kilos for the Gladiator. So it's a bit off the sort of one tonner tradition, but not too bad and brake towing capability is 2,721 kilograms, which again would be better if you could get that turbo diesel V6 here in Australia, but you can't. Next up, running costs. So what's it gonna cost you to run a Jeep Gladiator? Well, honestly, the most expensive part of it is gonna be fueling it because that 3.6 liter petrol V6 likes a drink. The claim is around 11 liters per 100 Ks in our testing, 15 litres per 100 combined is pretty realistic, a little bit less if you are taking it on longer road trips. So it's thirstier than its diesel rivals, I think that's fair to say. Now, the warranty is interesting. Uh, it used to be three years on Jeeps, and one of the things that Jeep Australia have done to try and bring a little bit of customer faith back to the longevity of the cars is they've lengthened the warranty to five years, but it's limited to 100,000 Ks, which feels a little bit on the short side to me, right? Like. I've got a friend with a Wrangler who does a lot of touring and 100,000 Ks would come up in two or three years, not five years, so there's that. But you do get lifetime roadside assist as long as you keep servicing the Gladiator with Jeep. So I guess that's a little bit more peace of mind there as well. Now the servicing of the vehicle is required every 12 months or 12,000 Ks, so a bit less convenient than most rivals which let you go 15,000 Ks between services, but at least the first five visits are capped at $399, bringing your five year total to $1,995, which is certainly more affordable than some of this vehicle's rivals. So what's the Gladiator like to drive? Because if you're anything like me, and a vehicle comes along that looks like this, it really needs to be able to back up that aggressive off-roading stance with dynamics to match. And so I guess <laughs> it really comes down to where you plan to use the Gladiator Rubicon because here, off-road, uh, it all makes a lot of sense. And all those Rubicon-specific features and the Gladiator's inherently high riding stance with plenty of clearance uh, all pay dividends here. And some of the things that make this a pretty compromised vehicle on the blacktop, you realize exactly what it's all about. And of course, if you're already a seasoned off-roader, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, the fact the Rubicon is outfitted on 32 inch BF Goodrich mud tires means that Steering response on tarmac is slow and you need to be pretty patient with the vehicle, but I mean, it's pretty dry where I am now, but out on the kind of fast, almost Baja-esque trails of the New South Wales Central Coast, there's stacks of grip and you can really tell what's going on underfoot. But I'll come back to that in a second. First of all, let's talk about the basics. So as I mentioned, the car has a 3.6 litre Pentastar petrol V6 as the sole engine. There's 209 kilowatts of power and 347 Newton meters from this motor. Channeled to all four wheels via an eight speed torque converter auto. Straight out of the blocks, the auto is pretty good. It does its best to harness the the torque of the engine on road. And then of course, for serious off-roading, we also have a proper transfer case with low range, enabling a crawl ratio of just over 77 to one. So the fact it's a petrol engine doesn't really affect you in that situation, even though I think that offering the turbo diesel V6 uh, would be a great alternative. So most of the time, the engine power is actually just adequate uh, it revs pretty hard, it sounds pretty good, and you know, it'll huff and puff going up hills on the highway, 
And in fact, the highway is not the Gladiator's natural habitat. There's a lot of wind noise from this bluff front end. The engine's working hard. So it's actually on the trails, and interestingly, in suburbia, <laughs> where the Gladiator feels most at home. Well, right now I'm on, on dirt, a trail which is partially groomed, and then at intervals just breaks down to, yeah, that Baja-esque undulating terrain. Sticks in the middle of the road that I'm dodging. Uh, and really the Gladiator makes life extremely easy. I'm not much of a four-wheel driving aficionado. I enjoy it when I do it. Uh, there'll be reviews out there dedicated to off-roading with the Gladiator that will give you a better, more detailed perspective on this environment. But the point is, is that if you're a mild to moderate off-roader like myself, the Gladiator Robicon makes it embarrassingly easy. I've mentioned the tires, unbelievably chunky and aggressive tire. I've mentioned the low range, but we also have the off-road plus mode, which really does all the calibration for you for throttle, transmission, traction control. It also conveniently loads the off-road pages on the eight inch touchscreen, which gives you heaps of information at a glance. Steering angle, pitch, roll, and access to the trail cams as a front and rear camera. Not quite at the sophistication of Land Rover's similar system, but it's not bad. It certainly helps you spot obstacles. The cameras are pretty good. But actually, visibility from where I'm sitting here is good. You have a really cool view over the Gladiator's bonnet with the latches to catch the windscreen if you want to take that off. So it looks cool, but also you get a really good view out. You get big square side mirrors. I can see behind me pretty well. So even though this is an enormous vehicle, placing it is actually not too bad. Now, the wheelbase is really long, uh, and so that does create some issues in terms of breakover. But thankfully, the Gladiator is, it rides pretty high, so I haven't actually got it stuck. The Rubicon also has those heavy-duty rock rails to help you try and slide over stuff you get caught on. Of course, you can accessorize virtually any dual cab to this level of ability, but like vehicles like the Ranger Raptor, the Hilux Rugged X to some extent, the Navara Warrior, the Gladiator Rubicon is all about giving you a solution out of the box, out of the dealership that you can just bring out here straight away and get along fine. But the reality is, is that with vehicles like this, you'll be fortunate if you can get it out onto the trail on a Saturday or a Sunday. But if it's gonna serve as your daily driver, you also want a ute to be pretty refined and that's not something utes have typically been in the past. So I'm moving on to the blacktop now, so out of off-road plus and into too high. Let's talk about what it's like on the kind of driving that you're gonna do Monday to Friday. The good news is it's actually pretty good. Compared to most utes, the Gladiator is quite refined actually. Uh, you still can tell that you're driving a frame vehicle. It's still agricultural to some degree, but it's better to drive than most of the utes out there. Interestingly, when we were filming uh, the waterside scenes with this car, we also had a Navara with us. And I was remarking to myself driving those cars back to back for the B-roll that you're probably seeing now, the Gladiator is to the Navara like a Golf GTI is to a Corolla. They're both fine transport, but the Gladiator feels sporty compared to most utes. Of course, I don't mean that it sits flat or that the steering is immediate and stuff. I just mean it's actually quite agile. And of course, substituting out a clattery diesel four-cylinder for a pretty silken petrol V6, relatively speaking, does wonders for noise, vibration, and harshness just like that. But then, I, as I mentioned, that engine gets pretty noisy when you want to pick up speed, but at least the noise it makes is good. The steering, again, it's better than what you get on most utes that the Gladiator competes with. It's still what you would describe as loose coming out of a car or a car-based SUV, but it's not as loose as it is on most utes. And plotting a line through sealed corners is actually 
pretty easy and you can hustle the Gladiator along really quickly, even on these mud tires. As long as you're patient, you just let the weight settle and then yeah, you can just hammer along, particularly because it rides really well. Um, as I mentioned, those tires are really chunky, but the Gladiator insulates road bumps really, really well. So it makes light work of most situations. It's just enormous and the crash rating isn't that great and it's very thirsty you know at 15 liters per 100 k's the touring range isn't that good so there's an 83 liter petrol tank you're gonna go through that in 500 k's or a little bit better so it's one of those things where if you're gonna do grand touring particularly off-road where you're tapping into this high revving v6 you're gonna need to carry additional fuel or have auxiliary fuel tanks fitted to the car. But I think more than anything, the Gladiator is kind of a lifestyle vehicle as car makers talk a lot about. It actually makes sense here in the Gladiator. It's a fun car or truck. Here in Australia, we don't really call them trucks, but I don't know, it kind of is, isn't it? It's fun. It's got character. It's definitely not perfect, but it makes you feel good as you drive it. And then it can actually stand up to punishment off-road without having to do very much to it. And, you know, I think that's a pretty appealing mixture. In terms of other basics, safety, you know, it's not too bad from an adaptive safety perspective. We have adaptive cruise control. We have forward collision warning. We don't have lane keep assist, however. There's blind spot monitoring. The reversing camera is really good. There are rear parking sensors, but not front. So it checks some boxes, but certainly not all. In terms of what I would consider as well as this car, you certainly are in high spec Ranger and Amarok territory. And those two utes are still really, really strong competitors. Of course, you can check out the new BT50 and D-Max too, which have a lot more safety tech even if their cabin technology is not that well integrated. So yeah, it's a, definitely an interesting car, the Gladiator. And if you're looking for a Ute, really for the appearance of it being pretty cool, you want a better than average cabin and you want all of that hardcore stuff, Fox shocks, big tires, yada yada, fit it to the car out of the box so you don't have to do anything, this car makes sense. So those are my opinions on the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. This vehicle has an undeniable cool factor and it's also highly capable if you intend on doing serious off-roading with this kind of vehicle. But even driven on-road, it is more refined than its dual cab competitors and I think it's better looking than most of them as well. So it could suit you if you're somebody that doesn't plan on doing massive kilometers in this car, just to keep yourself within that kind of warranty mileage limit of five years, 100,000 Ks, I think I'd be confident enough to have a crack at taking a punt on a Jeep Gladiator. I just wish they'd bring it out to Australia with the diesel engine, which would kind of tick one of those big boxes or, or sort of clear emissions from the lineup because the rest of it is actually pretty well sorted. Keen to know your view though, would you take a bet on a Jeep or are you still not quite at that point. While you're down there, make sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.